Hello everybody! In this video, I would like to demonstrate how we can create custom nodes for the Visual Shader Editor in Godot 4. It's a very useful functionality because, despite being a powerful tool, the Visual Shader Editor contains only a finite number of built-in nodes. Sometimes, we'd like to add more nodes that we want to use frequently. It's easy, and I'll show you how to do it right away. So, from the Godot documentation, we know that if we want to execute a script directly in the editor, it needs to have the tool annotation. It is here. That's the first condition. The second one is that the script defining a Visual Editor node must be a subclass of the Visual Shader node custom. Let's get started and add a new script to the shaders folder, which we'll name Grayscale GD since that's the exact effect we'll be implementing. In fact, I already did that and it's already implemented, so I will just go through the functions and explain them. By the way, I know that something like grayscale function already exists in the list of built-in functions, but that doesn't matter. What's important is that the code will be short and therefore clear for explanation. I think that class name is not mandatory in this case, but it won't cause any harm if we use it. Our code will become certainly more organized, especially if we add more custom nodes later on. So the class Visual Shader Node Custom provides virtual methods that need to be implemented for our node to function correctly. Not all of them are mandatory, but let's go through all of them. So let's start with get category. Uh, into this function, we'll write a category under which the custom node will appear in the dialog. It can be a simple string or a path separated by slashes. If we do not override this function, the node will be placed in the add-ons category without further division. Let me demonstrate it. I'll switch to Shader Editor when we have the Visual Shader. And if I right click, uh, you can see that the node is already included in the global add ons category and our color subcategory. And the name is Grayscale, we'll get to that shortly. So the second function is getCode. And this function is mandatory, which makes sense because without code, our node wouldn't do anything. Here, we insert logic in Godot shading language, this, this line, using input verse and output verse for the input and output. Furthermore, we can branch our code base on the currently active shader mode and type, but we'll get to that in a moment. For now, we just inserted code that takes the color of a pixel and returns its grayscale equivalent. The code is very simple and fits on one line, but if we wanted to split it into more, we have the option to use triple quotes for multi-line string. By the way, if you're wondering why I'm using these strange values, uh, instead of a simple arithmetic mean of RGB components, it's because the human eye has different sensitivity to different color shades. Therefore, calculating the grayscale in this way gives us a better result. The next function is get the default input port. It's not necessary to implement this function, especially when we are using only one input in our node. It makes sense when we want to define an input to which the node will automatically connect if we add it in this way. Let me click back and if we, for example, drag from this node to something and release the mouse, uh, we can add a node that would automatically connect, like add-ons, color, grail scale. Uh, by the way, as you can see, the automatic connection doesn't work from my node. I probably did something wrong, but I don't know what. So if you know, please write it into the comments. I'll just get rid of it, delete, and we can continue. 
Second, the next one is get description. This is an optional description that will appear in the dialog. We can demonstrate it. Just if I right click and select the note, we should see it right here. Okay, what's next? The next one is get funk code. This is an interesting feature. It allows us to insert code at the beginning of the respective shader function, like vertex, fragment, etc., regardless of the node's position in the graph. This could be used, for example, to declare variables or perform computations needed in, the, in an expression node, and so on. Uh, we don't need anything like that in our simple shader node, so I used only a comment to demonstrate that. But before it appears in the generated code, we must add the node to the graph and make it active. So I'll just do it quickly. Real scale, we must connect it like this. Ah, sorry. Okay, now it's a part of the graph. And when I click on this icon to show the generated code, we should see it at the vertex function because that's our condition. So let's do it. And if I scroll down, here it is. Vertex, it contains the comment, but the fragment, it does not because we return empty string. Uh, by the way, there is, um, we must be aware of always returning something because if we don't, let's see what happens. Or if I just comment out this line and open it again, uh, okay, no, I must save it first. And now we should see an error because uh, the return value is undefined. So, and it generates something like this. So just keep in mind that the function must always return a string, even an empty one. Okay, let's continue. Get global code. This is similar to the previous function with the difference that the code will be inserted at the beginning of the entire shader. Typical uses include defining preprocessor directives or including function libraries like GD Shader Inc. Again, caution is needed here to avoid conflicts with other custom nodes. Okay, and in this function, I also demonstrate branching the code using the custom option switch. I will get to that shortly once we reach functions like get property name and so on. So the next one, get input port count. This function is mandatory and defines the number of input ports. It's necessary to create at least one, otherwise it wouldn't be possible to add the node to the graph. As we can see, let me, let me just enlarge it, we have one uh, input port right here called RGB and also one output port. Uh, so um, the function get input port name, this is exactly where we define the name RGB and it is not mandatory, but certainly it's recommended. If we skip this function, Godot will automatically fill in something. I think the pattern is something like in and the number of port which is not as descriptive, of course. Get input port type. Yeah, this is where we define the type of the port, so it would be properly colored and work with only certain nodes to connect to. Of course, we defined it to vector 3D because uh, we are working with colors that have uh, three components. All right, what's next? It's a get name the name of the node. It is used here and also if we add node and find it here, this is the name from this function. Uh, okay, and of course, if we skip this function, won't implement it, I think Godot will automatically use something like unnamed. Very well, and now we have the same for output ports. So again, uh, output port count it's set to one we have only one output port this is the name of the port and this is the type of the value let's proceed with properties uh, what are properties we can use them to make our node more flexible 
For example, here uh, I define the one property that can have two different values, one and two, and we can observe it here. Property is called property, and there are two uh, values to choose from. And as I demonstrated earlier, based on the set value, I insert uh, the global code. So if we take a look at the generated code again, we should, uh, sorry, I didn't fix it yet. Uh, yes, I did, but it's not saved. So let's save it and now it should be okay. And here we can see the global code. We can see the word two because we are returning uh, this, this comment based on the uh, get option index zero. If I switch to one and generate again, we can see one here. All right, so this would be all about the properties. Uh, I mean, uh, where is it count, default index, <coughs> property name and property options and get return icon type. With this function, we can set the return value icon in the node list. Let's show it, add the node, add-ons, color and this small icon vec3 is exactly what this is for. If we omit this function, the default type is likely to be displayed such as float. Now let's get to the rest. Is available. Using the is available function, we can restrict the visibility of our code based on the shader mode or type. Uh, I've implemented that the node is visible for all modes, as we don't use mode at all, but only for the fragment function. So if I switch to, for example, vertex and try add node, it's not here. It disappeared from the list. Switch back to fragment, uh, fragment, and it should be there again. All right, and the last one is high end. So uh, this is the function that simply labels the node with the text Vulkan if it's set to true. Let's try it true and add the note uh, it's not here perhaps I have to save first and again add note color yeah here it is the red label Vulcan uh, this should alert the user not to use the note if for example they are working in the compatibility mode so uh, with that we should have everything ready and we can take a look how the node works in our shader. So first I'll get rid of it and show the shader how it looks without that. So switching to 2D. This is our shader from one of previous videos. Now when we add the grayscale and connect it, one, two, it should turn to gray and it works. Everything is converted to grayscale. Thank you for watching. As we've seen, creating custom nodes for visual shaders is really straightforward. And this way, we can prepare our own library of nodes that we would like to use when creating new shaders. So uh, have a great day and see you again sometime in the future.